Hey, City View, it's great to be with you on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. We're going to have an incredible service today, but before we get into praise and worship, I just want to welcome each and every single one of you. Charlie Land is going to be our special guest worship leader today. We're so excited to have Charlie with us. He's dear friends of Brad and Rebecca, and uh, we're just so thankful for his passion for worship and his love for people as he works with our team, and we're looking forward to a great service. Tamira Morales will be leading us also in communion. So I want to encourage you to get your emblems ready for that after worship is over. And then we'll dive into the word as we start our new series, Unshakable, Standing Firm in an Unsteady World. God bless you, Lord. We pray for a mighty move of your spirit as we worship you in spirit and in truth and reality and love. And we do these things in remembrance of you as we take communion after worship. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's have church.
to imagine for many of us as we're watching this on our screens it can feel like there's a lot of darkness around us there's a season of unknown right now where we don't have control there's so much in your life and in my life and all of our lives that are simply beyond us that can feel like darkness that can feel like there's fear that can kind of come in and overwhelm you it's moments like this though when we set aside distractions we create our own personal altar. Remember, the altar is not about a specific place in a specific building. It's the place that you meet God. It's the in-between where he does his best work, his finest work, because it's oftentimes in those moments that we're surrendered, that we come into his presence knowing that we're not enough. We don't have the answer. We go to the one who does have the answers. I would just encourage you right now, wherever you're at, if you're watching at your kitchen table, at the beach, lucky, at home, wherever, make wherever you're at your own personal altar right in this moment. And just trust that God will meet you there. His presence, His Holy Spirit will come alongside you and He'll give you a peace that passes understanding. He'll give you a joy that maybe you haven't felt since March 12th. It's okay. He has.
has this. God's got this. There's nothing in this moment, in this season of COVID-19 that is surprising the creator of the universe. But this is a chance for us to learn to trust, to learn to lean into his presence. So right now, let's just take a moment to pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for moments like this. That even when we don't see it, we know you're working. Even when we don't feel it, we know you're working. In and on every heart, on every family. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. We honor you, Lord Jesus. In our own personal altars, wherever they may be, God, we just pray that we would sense you in such a new and real, fresh way. Amen. Together we sing.
just want to say thank you for joining us in this time of worship. I know it looks different in this season, but keep leaning in. Keep leaning into his presence. He'll meet you there. He'll meet us there. In a few moments, we're going to hear from our lead pastor, Pastor Troy. But thanks again for singing with us. Good morning. Today we'll be partaking of communion, and this is a time for us to remember, reflect on the Lord and what he's done. I'd like to start in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, let me know, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. In Galatians 2.16, it says that we know a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. We know this to be true because if there was any other way for us to be right, made right with God, Christ would not have had to die. With that being said, communion is for any person who believes or trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always a good idea to examine ourselves before taking communion. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence while we examine ourselves before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time and we humbly pray to you and ask for you to still our minds and quiet our hearts as we take this time to remember you and all that you've done for us on Calvary. Father God, we pray that you bring us closer to you and that you bring us peace amongst all the chaos that's happening today in the world. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do for us. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26, it says, let's please take the bread element. It says, then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Well, what a wonderful time of worship and uh, praise we had with Charlie. And thank you, Tamara, for leading us with the emblems of the bread and the cup for communion as we did that in remembrance of him. And today we start a new series called Unshakable, Standing Firm in Unsteady World, as we talk about why the church can't be silent anymore or should not be silent anymore. And I want to say thank you personally for the prayers for my brother, um, he is improving. He's still in ICU. Uh, he's still on the ventilator and so forth, but there are signs of uh, significant improvement. And so we appreciate your prayers for not only um, him and his wife and his children, but also for me and my family <clears throat> and my mom and dad uh, at this time as well. So I'll tell you, there's probably over a thousand people praying for my brother and family, and you're a part of that. So again, I want to say thank you and God bless you. Well, as our country has been deteriorating over the decades, we've witnessed the destruction of many things in our culture today. We've, we've experienced the destruction of the sanctity of marriage between one man and a woman, the removal of God's word from most of public places and even prayer, uh, the removal of um, the church being oppressed like it's being today uh, during this pandemic, horrific racism, constant rebellion, and the continuation of blatant murdering of millions of babies through abortions. And in the middle of all of this, if the church is not careful, silence speaks volumes. Now, friends, I believe that the church regulates the spiritual condition of God's people. 
which eventually affects our nation. Now, Jim Garlow, a great pastor, once said there are approximately 364,000 churches in America. Listen to me, 72%, he said, or 264,000 of them are liberal, meaning they really don't care about the Bible. According to the exhaustive surveys, uh, somewhere between 6,000 and 15,000 actually have a bona fide biblical worldview. That is, they see life through the lens of Scripture. But did you catch what I said? Nearly 72% of churches don't look to the Bible as the final authority and direction in God's Word. No wonder America is crumbling from within. Our foundation is deteriorating, friends. And, and we're living in a day where people want to be entertained in the church and uh, they want everyone to be happy. Pastors want to make sure everyone's happy and everything's fine and, because we don't want to step on any toes and fear that they might leave the church. But our culture in America might choose to ignore the murder of millions of babies in the womb, disrespect and want to defund the police, d- uh, desecrate society, pillage and destroy the gender of identity of a boy and a girl, um, redefine marriage, support immorality and perversion, back ungodly movements. And while this happens, many churches and many pastors are supposed to keep their mouths shut on many of these issues that I just mentioned. But I want you to know as your pastor, I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. And never should I. And us as a church, we should never be silent on the variety of issues that I just discussed. The Bible calls me as your pastor to be a watchman who cries out and sounds the alarm to a waking, sleeping giant called the church of Jesus Christ. God has called me to speak the truth, even on tough issues, even on issues that you may not necessarily want to hear or would like me to to speak about. Yes, we need to unite against sin. We need to unite against the works of darkness and call it out when necessary. But if we're going to change the world, it's not going to happen through a post on social media. It's going to happen when a person turns completely to Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Now, we're living in a day where social justice and the social gospel is being swallowed up by the church. But if, we're not properly, if it's not properly explaining the difference of the two, which in this nine-week series we'll eventually talk about those things, it can become extremely dangerous because it removes redemption through Christ. It, and basically, the social justice and the social gospel is about what you do rather than what he's done. And I'm so thankful that <clears throat> we have a national day of prayer here in America. But more than a national day of prayer, what we need is a national day or a national week of repentance. Because racism is not the only sin that our nation is dealing with today, friends. At the heart of many churches today, people are dealing with frustration. People are dealing with digital fatigue. People are dealing with fear. They're dealing with anxiety. They're dealing with stress. They're dealing with attitudes. And if we're not careful, church, pastors and boards can be more worried about the finances of the church than they can about souls during this pandemic. But in the middle of all of that, when the church chooses to be silent, When the church chooses to be silent and not pray or repent, it can lead to shattered lives and depression. The great Ian Bounds said, and I quote, when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. When faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. Now, we are, there are plenty of reasons to be upset as followers of Jesus Christ or to protest or to be frustrated, but where are the Christ for prayer? Where are the Christ for repentance on a daily basis from God's people? Now, friends, have you ever noticed that when your prayer life grows or, or, or your time in the Word grows or your worship to the Lord grows or maybe you, you, you dive into what you believe and, and why you believe it, have you ever noticed that when those things happen, there's a sense of boldness that comes over you? There's a sense of boldness that comes over the church of Jesus Christ. But the more we're concerned about the opinions of others, guess what I'll tell you right now? The less bold you'll become. Because we're focused on what man says or what people say or society say about what we say or do. And let me just tell you something, friends. I want to encourage you, if you want to write this down or you want to pause this thing for a second, I want to encourage you to do that. Let me tell you something. Boldness cannot be worked up. You can't work up boldness. It must be brought down as we surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. We cannot work up boldness. It's something that simply has to be brought down as we surrender our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many, church, too many churches in America don't want to battle the darkness, but rather what they'd want to do is they want to just sign a peace treaty with the ways of the world, or, or they want to just pass it on to the paid pastors of the church and so forth. A quote often attributed to Alexis uh, de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who uh, authorized democracy in America in the early 1800s, he was the original Alexis, I guess, um, helps to identify how far we've drifted. And he says this, and I quote, it'll be up on the screen. 
It was not until I went to the churches of America, he's talking about in the 1800s, and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness, did I understand the secrets of her success. America is great because she is good. And if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. You see, Alexis saw that the church in that time were game changers. They were game changers. They were movement makers. They were pace setters who were setting the standards of righteousness in the world which they lived in, and they weren't following the trends of this world or of that culture. And we're called to direct people towards righteousness because it's through righteousness that we'll see change in our homes. We'll see change in our lives. We'll see change in our communities. We'll see change in our state and our nation and even in our churches. And the church, if it's not careful in these unsteady times, can drift off course really quick. Just like when you go to the beach, you, you can drift off real, real quick because of the tides and the riptides and, and the waves and all sorts of stuff from where you're starting. The church is in that same situation in these unsteady times that we're dealing with. But there is hope. There's always hope in Christ Jesus. Amen. Zechariah 1.3 says, Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. You see, church, when you and I choose to return to God, He returns to us. We need to remember that boldness comes directly from the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that God calls us to be is compromised when we're too busy. Everything that God wants us to be is compromised when we have no time for Him or even His church. And we've got to be careful of those in the, things, in the days we're living in. Why, friends? Because America is on fire. America is on fire, not in a good way, but in a negative way. And we need a fresh move of the Spirit of the living God on our nation today. You may not like to hear that, but it's the truth. And when the church is silent, all hell breaks loose. Because there is no confrontation, there's no discussion about the conviction of sin, but we're called to fight with spiritual weapons of prayer, of worship, to stand strong and firm in the Word of God, and to expose the unfruitful works of darkness as we wrap it in the Spirit of love. See, church, the burden of, uh, of responsibility rests squarely upon our shoulders. It's our responsibility. It's our choice to either stand up for what's right or to fall and fade with the morning fog with whatever's in at that specific time in our culture. That is why the church is to be the pillar. That is why the church of Jesus Christ is to be the foundation for the days in which we're living in. Have you ever seen a house being built from the roof down? No, it starts with the foundation up. And if the foundation is not strong in our, in our churches, the, the, the rest of the home will crumble eventually because we're not being the pillar and we're not being the foundation of truth in the days we're living in. I love what it says in 1 Timothy 3.15. It says, So that if I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. And this is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, there are many things that the church should do. There's no doubt about that. We should be reaching our community. We should be building those in faith um, so that they can go out and, and be influencers for the kingdom of God. But one of the major responsibilities of the church is to hold up to God's standards. The major responsibility of the church is not only to hold up to God's standards, but God's values and foundational truth that, that are found in the word of God. And in our culture, especially today, it is very unpopular to speak about biblical truth about serious issues that we're dealing with in our land. It's not politically correct to do so, but friends, the church should never be concerned about being politically correct. The church of Jesus Christ, rather, should be more concerned about being biblically correct than politically correct in the days that we're living in. We're dealing with progressive leaders who have a secular humanistic agenda, far from Scripture, from the political world to ed the educational field, as well as Hollywood and the media, as they bring their secular philosophies and other movements in our culture that they deem important, that they deem necessary, that they deem essential, and that are okay. And I have one question to ask you this morning. When you're dealing with all of this bombardment, who is left to tell the truth that will set them free? To be honest, it should be the church of Jesus Christ. It should be us as Christians because our decisions are not based on polls. Our decisions are based on the Word of God and the authority of Scripture. Now in 2020, despite a global pandemic with COVID-19 uh, ravaging our nation, economic uncertainty, closings and reopenings, lawlessness abounding, civil unrest, uh, and, and being in an election year for our nation and all the division between candidates and parties, this is not the time for the church to, sh to shrink back. 
This is not the time for the church to go in a corner and just woe is me and, and whatever it may be. But this is our time to stand strong. This is our time to proclaim the truth of Scripture wrapped in His love, wrapped in compassion, mercy, and grace. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And we are not to let this light hide under a bucket. It is to shine. It is to shine. But there is one thing that will affect the church from being affected. There is one thing that will happen, and that is when the church of Jesus Christ chooses to remain silent. Let me tell you something, friends. When the church is silent, it, it, it can easily for, forsake the vulnerable if it's not careful. When the church is silent, silent, it begins to cave in and show support for sexual immorality. What was once wrong is now right, and what was once right is now wrong. When the church is silent to sin, it chooses to remain slaves to sin. When the church is silent concerning certain hot topics or issues facing our nation, it can literally turn into a betrayal of what the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. That is why the church should not and cannot be silent anymore, especially today and in the days that we're living in. So I want to discuss a couple of things that that we can do that might happen, as a matter of fact, when the church is silent, unfortunately. When the church is silent, here's what happens, friends. Humanity will lose the perspective on what God has done for them and who they are in Him. When we remain silent, humanity will lose the perspective on what God has done for them and who they are in Him. Now, in the Old Testament, we we know that the Lord instituted the Passover, as an annual reminder that he delivered Israel from slavery. And in Exodus 22, it says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now in the New Testament, Jesus instituted communion, which we, we just did as a, as a church in remembrance of him. And as, and as a church, we received and partake, partook in communion so that we can never forget the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of why Jesus came to this earth. He came to this earth to die for our sins so that we would be delivered, so that we'd be forgiven of our sins. And because of what Jesus did on that cross and three days later rose from the grave, we now can have a relationship with the living God through the gift of salvation in him. We need to not only remember what God has done for us, but we also need to remember who we are in Him. We can talk about what the Lord has done to others by acknowledging ourselves as sinners delivered by the blood of Jesus. It's called your testimony. Every single one of you have a testimony of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's power, of God's truth, of God's love taking over your life in a circumstance or a situation that he wants you to remember who you are in him and what he's done in your life so that you can share that with the others. But we can also reach others by doing random acts of kindness, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk and doing rags, ra- random acts of compassion by what we do, uh, by particularly what we do for our neighbors and our community. You see, the children of Israel experienced oppression. Are you experiencing oppression? They felt abandoned. Have you ever felt abandoned? They felt isolated while in Egypt, while they were slaves to Egypt. And having known that pain, the children of Israel were called to be gracious to the sojourner and the oppressed. The implications are clear, and that is we cannot be silent, but rather we must be willing to do something in word and in deed toward our neighbor. Let me ask you a couple of questions this morning. Have you ever been forgiven by God? I believe you have. And if you have, then you must learn to forgive. Have you ever been comforted by the Holy Spirit? then you must learn to comfort others because 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, remind them, that reminds us that God says, comfort us, and he comforted us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever been loved by God? Oh, I bet you have. Then you shouldn't have a problem loving others as you remember the words of Jesus who said in John 13.34, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. We should not remain silent for the vulnerable, friends, the fearful, the oppressed, the isolated, the sinful, because we've all been there sometime or another, or maybe we're still in that state of vulnerability to sin or fearful of the things that surround us. But because of God's love, we can love the vulnerable. We can love those that feel enslaved to sin as we speak truth into their lives and serve them. I love what 1 John 4, 10 through 12 says. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, and if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The second thing I want to tell you this morning, friends, is when the church is silent, we can't reveal, we can't reveal the true character of God to those who need him. 
When the church remains silent, we can't reveal the true character of God to those who need Him. Now, many of you maybe know William Wilberforce. He was an incredible man of God. There was a movie made about him, I think called Amazing Grace, and this English parmetellian uh, was more than just that. He was responsible for the abolition of the slave trade and the emancipation of slaves in England. Wilberforce wrote, and I quote, God Almighty has placed me to do great, two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Now, for William Wilberforce, his political advocacy on behalf of the enslaved people was a direct response to the call of God upon his life. His prayers are clear. He said this, and I quote, he said, If it pleases God to honor me so far, may I be the instrument of stopping such a, a course of wickedness and cruelty as never before disgraced a Christian country, close quote. See, Wilberforce, as a public servant, knew God called him to speak up and to defend the slaves. I love what it says in Exodus 20, verse 7. It says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, a lot of times when we read that scripture, we think about the unchurched. But I think it's just as much for the church as it is for the unchurched because the Hebrew word, her word translated above as take that I just mentioned in the scripture that I read more literally means to bear. To bear. To bear the name of God in vain means one of two things. It means to bear the name of the Lord to no purpose, or it can mean to bear the name of the Lord falsely, which suggests bearing the name of the Lord in manner is that is a is false of his character of who he is. And that is precisely the hypocrisy for which Paul rebuked the Jews in the New Testament, charging them, uh, charging them in Romans 2 24 when he said, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of us. The question is not whether we will bear his name, but rather how will we bear his name in the days that we're living in? Are we going to remain silent? Are we going to go off to the corner? Are we going to stand up for truth in the midst of persecution? Or I wouldn't even say we're in persecution. I'd say we're in oppression, but we're getting close to knocking on on persecution like the church has never seen before. And one of the ways the world seeks to silence the church is to draw a boundary around our witness. They literally say, you can't go past this line. You can only stay in this box. These are your boundaries. Separation of church and state, whatever they want to use against us. And as these secularists suggest, they basically want to say God has no place in public affairs. And let me just tell you something. That is not true. And that is not right. Bearing the image of God faithfully in our days means at least two things. It means being clear that the Lord reigns over every affair of our life and that he loves everyone and that Jesus is willing to forgive all manner of sin in one's life. It also means that our lives reflect the character of God, like I said, towards the vulnerable, the oppressed, the lonely, the hurting with our actions and our finances, like helping those in need during difficult times, perhaps serving in some capacity in the church, Maybe even looking into fostering a child or adopting a child who would otherwise be aborted or abandoned. Maybe it's extending Christian love to your community and the families and children around your your neighborhood who may be in crisis. Or as we hold out Christ to them, not only in the one who forgives them of their sins, but also the one who is near to those who call upon his name. Why? Because our actions as a church faithfully bear the name of Christ. We are Christ ambassadors, friends. And on the other hand, a silent and complacent church not only fails to carry out the call of God, but it also bears false witness, basically declaring that the Lord is not in the end overly concerned about people. And if we're not careful, we reveal the true character of God to those who desperately need Him when we're silent. When the church is silent, we can't reveal the truth of the character of God. That is why, church, the church cannot afford to be silent anymore because our times demand it. Our history is compelling us to do something. Our future is depending on the church of Jesus Christ. And most importantly is this, God is watching you and me. He's watching us. He's watching what we say, what we do, how we respond, how we react. And unfortunately, too many Christians are opting out of the decision to to not be salt, to not be the light to our country, where literally morality is hanging by a thread, friends. If you don't see it, you're as blind as a bat understand we are living in dark days like never before and one of the best things we can do during these unsteady times in the midst of the threats of sickness in the midst of death in the midst of financial uncertainty and societal uh, upheaval is we need to remember how great 
We need to remember how good, we need to remember how strong and mighty and how faithful our God truly is, and we've got to share that with the world. We've got to share that with the world. And how do we do that? We show the love of God out loud through our actions. Through our actions. Have you ever heard someone say to you, let your actions speak louder than your words? Well, you know what, friends? In 165, there was a plague that swept through the mighty Roman Empire. Kind of like in our world today and even in our nation. Wiping out one in three of the population during that time. It happened again in 251 when 5,000 people per day were dying in the city of Rome alone, in one city. Those infected were abandoned by their families to literally just die on the streets. The government was helpless. The emperor himself succumbed to the plague. Pagan priests fled their temples where people had flocked for comfort and explanation. People were too weak to help themselves. If the smallpox did not kill you, hunger and thirst and loneliness would in that process. Almost sounds like what we're dealing with today. The effect on wider society was catastrophic, yet following the plagues, the good reputation of Christianity was confirmed and its population grew rapidly. Why is this, friends? Because Christians did not come armed with intellectual answers to the problems of evil. They did not enjoy supernatural ability to avoid the pain and suffering that they were experiencing as well. What they did was they had water they had food, and they had the presence of the Almighty God and their presence as well in the midst of those circumstances. In short, if you knew a Christian, you were, you were statistically more likely to survive during that day and age. Did you know? Can you believe that? That it was the church that helped Rome during that time in the days that they were living in. And if you survived, it was the church that offered you the most loving, the most stable, and the most social environment. Church, we've got a responsibility. We've got a work to do. And I know we are doing it. But to whom much is given, much is required. And we have to step up to the plate like never before. This is not the time to be silent. This is the time to shine the love of Jesus Christ through our actions. It was a simple conviction of normal women and men that what they did for the least of their neighbors, they did it for Jesus. Every head is bowed and eyes are closed in this holy moment as we wrap up our time together, friends. And I want to encourage you to join us next week as we talk about the cancel culture and what Jesus has to say about that and what the Scripture says about that too. But as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to ask you a couple of questions before I pray for you. Are you willing to be bold for Jesus in these days? And you say to yourself, Pastor, I want to be bold. I need to be bold. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit to help you. Then I want to pray for you today. Secondly, are you willing to shine His love to others? Not just in word, but in deed. And maybe that's your desire. Maybe you just need God to fill you with more of His love. Because His love casts away all fears and doubts. His love... Um, you know, never fails. It sticks closer than a brother. And you need that perfect love of God in your life. Are you willing to remain truthful to His Word? Are you, really, are you willing to dive in and, 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 and to search what the Scriptures say about certain things and not just be swayed by uh, social media or popular opinion or, you know, whatever it may be, or liberal theology or whatever, whatever it is that is surrounding you and trying to choke the authentic Word of God, the authoritative Word of God out of, your, out of your heart and your mind and your body? Is there a certain sin in your life that you need to repent of or, or desire for the Lord, the Lord for, to deliver you from? Tell Him what it is right now. Maybe you struggle with an, an anger or frustration or anxiety or depression or you're dealing with other circums of lust or certain things that are just surrounding you. Father, I pray that those things would would um, just become shadows in the likes of your presence right now in the name of Jesus, that you would deliver your people right now. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and, and today you want to rededicate your life to him maybe, or you want to give your life to the Lord for the very first time. I want to pray for you right now. But maybe that's where you're at right now, and you're, you're in your home, or you're listening in your car, or wherever you may be. Just make that your personal altar right now, and cry out to God. And so Father, right now we come to you, and Lord, we pray for boldness in your church like never before. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us 
And, and Lord, we believe by faith that, Lord, as we seek your face, as we repent, as we pray, as we worship, as we dive into your word, as, as we study it, as we, we go through uh, finding the truth and issues that we're dealing with, God, that when we have those aha moments, God, that, God, there will be a spirit of boldness that comes upon our lives like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like Daniel, like Esther, like, like Abraham, and so forth. The list goes on and on and on and on and on of men and women of God in the Bible and throughout history who were bold in their faith like Martin Luther as well. God, give us the willingness to shine your love to others. Maybe it starts in our home. Maybe it starts where we work. Maybe it starts where we go to school or when we go to school, Lord. Lord, maybe it's in our churches. Maybe it's in our communities, Lord. But Lord, let people see Jesus in our eyes. Let them feel Jesus in our touch and let them hear Jesus in our voice as we shine your love, Lord. Lord, help us to remain truthful to your word, to not be swayed and Lord, not to play, base our, our opinions and our facts on shifting sands, but on the solid rock of your word, God. Forgive us, Lord God, for compromising or, or, or changing a little bit of this or that, Lord God, so that it, it makes us happy or makes us feel good or, or it matches what we desire. Lord, it's not our will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray, Lord Jesus. And for those that are dealing with certain sins in their life, Lord God, and as they're repenting and they're crying out for deliverance, God, deliver your people. Deliver them just like you delivered the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, out of the shackles of slavery, Lord God. Deliver them from the slavery of sin, Lord, and the things that are holding them down from first, second, third, and fourth generation. In the name of Jesus, we break off those curses and we pray for divine healing and divine restoration in their lives. And for those that want to give their life to you or rededicate their life, just repeat this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I admit I'm a sinner, but Jesus, I believe you died on that cross and you rose from the grave and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Friend, I want to tell you, if you did that, you made the greatest decision in your life. So Father, as we wrap up this message, this is not the time for us to be silent, but this is the time for us to be bold for the Lord our God is with us as we speak truth wrapped in compassion and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you, don't turn us off yet. You've got a, a Monte the Magnificent who's got some things he wants to say to you. And then I have a giving living moment that I want to share with you as we receive the tithe and offering or you give sometime today or even this week. Love you. Have an outstanding day. God bless you. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed today's service, please share it with your friends and family. If you haven't already, we would love it if you would give us a like on Facebook by searching for City View SD. If your friends and family like the service, please encourage them to give us a like as well. You can follow our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts by searching City View San Diego or by visiting our website and going to the messages page. We also recently started a new YouTube page and would love some new subscribers. You can find us at youtube.com slash c slash cityviewchurchsd. We want to invite each and every one of you to join us for our next drive-in outdoor service here on the church campus at 6 p.m. this Saturday night. You can join us online at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings if you can't make it Saturday nights. You can email us at prayer at cityviewsd.com to let us know how we can pray for you, how this message ministered to you, or perhaps today you gave your life to Christ for the very first time or rededicated your life to Him. If you did, we have a free gift for you called One Little Yes Can Change Your Life. Just email us at prayer at cityviewsd.com or call the church at 858-560-1870 to let us know you made the greatest decision of your life today. One last thing, there is a quick reminder that you can give three different ways to continue to help support God's church and the kingdom. The first is by giving online through our website at cityviewsd.com and clicking on the Give Now button. From there, you can give your regular tithe and offerings, missions offerings, or anything else you want to give. All the info is right there on the giving page. Second, you can text to give at 858-780-5141. And lastly, you can just do it the good old-fashioned way and drop it in the mail to 8404 Phyllis Place, San Diego, California, 92123. Please make sure to put attention to the finance department. Make sure to check out our website for the latest City View news. And here is Pastor Troy to close us out with a quick giving living moment. As we continue to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithe and offerings, 
I'd like to share something with you in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. It says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will also be. Now money is a part of our earthly treasures, but God is not after our money. He wants our heart. He knows our heart flow, uh, when our hearts flow, uh, there's our treasures. When we invest our treasures in His kingdom, our hearts will be there too. There's a safe place for your heart and your treasure. In City View Church, as we give of our tithe and offerings today or sometime this week, understand that this first Sunday of a new month, God has incredible plans in store for you and your loved ones as well as His church. I'm so excited what God is doing here at City View. I want to thank you for being faithful. And if you haven't started in the habit of giving, I encourage you to start today as you watch God do something supernaturally in your life like never before. So let me pray for you as we close out our online service today as you give through the various means of giving this today or sometime this week. God, we thank you for this opportunity for a wonderful service. Lord, help your church to not remain silent, but to show your love, to speak truth, and to walk in, in integrity, Lord God, and, and to humbly walk before you and others, Lord. We cry out for prayer and repentance to be our, our theme. And we pray, Lord, today as we give, Lord, that you will use these offerings for our missionaries or the tithe for your church to continue to expand your kingdom. Lord, we give you glory and praise, and I pray that you would continue to go with my brothers and sisters, that you would rebuke the devourer for their sake, and that you would make ways where there seems to be no ways for their financial breakthrough or for other circumstances that they're dealing with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.